So today's speaker is Dr. David Leiden. David did his PhD at MIT under the supervision of Professor Paula Capolaro. During his PhD, David developed techniques for utilizing tools from quantum error correction to enhance metrology and sensing. David has also published articles on topics ranging from polarimetry to flux qubits. David graduated from MIT in 2020 and then joined IBM, where he now works as a research scientist in quantum computing. We're thrilled and excited to have you here, David, and this afternoon for us in the morning for you to tell us about the latest um, news on the IBM quest for, for quantum advantages. So, so thanks very much for waking up early and, and, and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, David. So, uh, so yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, uh, to speak with you all today and to share what I think are exciting new results. So quantum computing is in an interesting gray area right now, by which I mean that we can make quantum devices that are difficult to play classically in the sense that they produce outputs that are random, but that nonetheless follow very complicated distributions. And yet these devices don't yet beat classical computers at useful tasks. So in other words, the distributions that describe them don't actually arise in applications. And so to bridge this gap, some colleagues and I developed from scratch and experimentally demonstrated a new quantum algorithm that leverages what quantum computers do naturally in order to sample from distributions that arise in applications. So and for today, I'd like to start by introducing this sampling problem and the classical algorithms that are currently used to solve it. This will naturally lead into our quantum algorithm, which will uh, evaluate using both simulations and experiments. So I'd like to start by diving in and getting some math out of the way, and then taking a step back in a minute for broader context. So the underlying setting here has to do with the classical Ising model, where each instance of this model is defined by coefficients j and h uh, that are given to us as part of the problem statement. And together, these define this function E of S that's sometimes called an energy function, which assigns some real scalar value to every n-bit string S. Now, um, these n-bit strings are sometimes called spin configurations or just states, depending on your field. And it's convenient and common to visualize this function in 1D as defining a sort of landscape, like I'm showing here. Now, this function by itself is not a probability distribution, but it does define the distribution that we'll ultimately be interested in, namely the corresponding Boltzmann distribution, which assigns some probability mu of s to every bit string s that's proportional simply to the negative exponential of the energy of s divided by some coefficient t. Now, this z out front is called a partition function, and it's just a normalizing constant to make sure that all these probabilities sum to 1. Uh, and this parameter t is often called the temperature in physics, and it's just some positive parameter that's given to us as part of the problem specification. So the problem will be to sample from this distribution, but let's first think about what the distribution looks like. So at low temperature, the distribution is sharply peaked on the ground state, meaning the global minimum, the lowest energy spin configuration. In the opposite limit of uh, high temperature, the distribution instead approaches the uniform. The regime that we'll mostly be interested in is the hard intermediate regime, in which this Boltzmann distribution is uh, not just peaked on the global minimum, but rather has substantial support over a number of different low energy states that may be far from one another. So um, we will ultimately want to sample from this distribution. And I'll, I'll um, try to, to emphasize throughout that this is really uh, a related but a distinct problem from optimization. So we're not just interested in finding the global minimum here. Now, these are simple equations, but the sampling problem turns out to be exponentially hard in large part because we're dealing, or sorry, the, the sampling problem turns out to be hard. I'll qualify that later, uh, in large part because the state space that we're dealing with is exponentially large here. So to give you a flavor of where the difficulties come in, um, notice that this partition function, this normalizing factor z here, while uh, simple to write, while it's simple to write down an expression for it, uh, it would involve a sum over all possible n-bit strings, of which there are exponentially many. 
And so it means that in general, we can actually evaluate this normalizing factor Z here, which means that even though we have this nice expression, we in general can't actually even find the Boltzmann probabilities, the, re the actual numbers, I mean. And so in a sense, we have this implicit description of the distribution, but we don't really see the distribution itself. And yet nonetheless, we're gonna wanna sample from it. So to be a little bit more formal about that, the task will be to output random n-bit strings such that the probability of outputting any particular string is just equal to the Boltzmann probability of that string, perhaps to within some desired error tolerance. And the figure of merit we'll be using is the computational complexity. So how many iterations are required to produce these samples? Now, taking a step back as promised, if you haven't seen this problem before, you might wonder why you should care about it. It does seem a little esoteric, but I assure you it's not. It actually arises in a number of different applications. So historically, the Ising model was first proposed in the context of physics as an early model of magnetism in materials. And the Boltzmann distribution corresponds to uh, thermal distribution in this model. Now, where the sampling bit comes in is if you wanted to estimate the thermal average of some physical quantity F. Um, so this could be something like uh, the magnetization or some correlation function. <clears throat> Now, you could, of course, evaluate the, the formal expression for expectation value, which I've written here, uh, which involves a sum over exponentially many terms. Or you could often approximate it much more cheaply using Monte Carlo by uh, drawing samples from this Boltzmann distribution and then just averaging over them uniformly. This exact same trick is used in machine learning, specifically in Boltzmann machines and energy-based models more broadly. Uh, which are generative models used, uh, or which are, yeah, um, statistical models used for generative modeling. They're essentially classical Ising models used for machine learning. And there, the sampling is a bottleneck both in the training and the inference steps. Finally, uh, again, optimization is not the same thing as sampling, but sampling is sometimes used as a subroutine for optimization, in particular in the simulated annealing algorithm, which works by sampling from Boltzmann distributions for some Ising model at gradually decreasing temperatures in the hopes of eventually finding the ground state. So there are uh, many different strategies for random sampling, and the one that is uh, typically used in high dimensional settings like this one is called Markov chain Monte Carlo. And the idea is simply to run a random walk over your state space. So the idea is that you start in some state shown by this black dot here, for instance, and you make a random jump to a different state and another one and so on. And if at every iteration you pick your next move uniformly at random, you would find that in the long run, you tended to spend about the same amount of time at every one of these bit strings. On the other hand, if you jumped in some directions more often than others, you would find that you might start spending more time at some states and less at others. And so the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC for short, is simply to pick these transition probabilities carefully such that the fraction of time that I spend at some particular bit string converges to the Boltzmann probability associated with that same bit string. And so uh, the idea is to simply set up this random walk to let it run until it converges and to just start recording your position. And those will eventually give you your samples from the Boltzmann. Theory. Now, of course, the natural concern here is how exactly do you pick these fine-tuned transition probabilities in order to ensure distribution to this, uh, sorry, ensure convergence to this particular distribution? This is an obvious question in the sense that it seems like this might be hard, in which case we would just have traded one problem for another, or one hard problem for another. Um, but it turns out there's a very nice trick for this, and it dates back to uh, Los Alamos in the early 50s and was, in fact, one of the early uses of classical electronic computers. The idea is to break down each random jump into two steps. So in step one, uh, if your current state is S, by some means, which I'll elaborate later, you propose some new random bit string S prime. Then you go to step two and you compute this quantity called the acceptance probability that I've written with the letter A here. This number turns out to always be between zero and one. And so with probability A, you actually complete the jump and the rest of the time you just stay put and try again in the next iteration. And it turns out that under very mild assumptions for what you do in step one, 
If you just iterate through these two steps, you are guaranteed to converge to the Boltzmann distribution. Of course, you might be looking at all this and be concerned about the acceptance probability because it involves this uh, ratio of uh, mu of s prime over mu of s, these two Boltzmann probabilities that I just said were in general uh, not efficiently tractable. But it turns out that something uh, remarkable happens, which is if you write out this fraction, uh, you see that even though the numerator and the denominator uh, cannot be evaluated efficiently separately, the ratio is actually much simpler because this normalizing term, this partition function drops out. And so what we're left with is something that just takes at most quadratic time to compute. And so that means that we can do the second step very quickly, meaning that we can iterate through these steps quickly. And this is what underpins and enables the whole algorithm. Now, this is a very powerful approach. It often works very well. And when it doesn't, it's still often the best tool we have at our disposal. Now, when I say it sometimes doesn't work well, I don't mean that it doesn't converge, but rather that it could converge very slowly. In the issue of that, by demanding convergence to the Boltzmann distribution, we necessarily introduce an asymmetry between uphill moves and downhill moves. Um, so the idea is that if in step one, you propose a move that's downhill, in other words, energy decreasing, like this one here, it will always be accepted with probability one. Um, now, on the other hand, uphill moves, they are allowed in this algorithm, but they're not always accepted in step two. And in particular, the probability with which they get accepted depends on how far uphill they move. So a move, uh, a proposed move like this, for instance, has a relatively small increase in energy. So it's reasonably likely to be accepted in step two, although not with a probability of one anymore. On the other hand, an uphill move like this one here that goes sharply up in energy is overwhelmingly likely to be rejected. And so it means that you'll almost certainly end back up at your, um, at your, your starting point near the local minimum here. And the reason these rejected moves are important is that the clock keeps ticking, right? So even if you pose a move, it gets rejected and you just start over, that still takes some time. And so this can, this can dramatically slow down the algorithm. Now, the underlying issues that make this a problem are when we have a rough energy landscape like I've drawn here, which is more or less the generic case at a relatively low temperature as compared to the, the characteristic scale of the landscape. Now, these, uh, the net effect of these two is that uh, the algorithms tend to quickly find their way into local minima, but then can be quite slow to escape. And uh, that means that it's quite slow for them to actually get out of one local minimum, one low energy region over to another, and to actually explore all the various low energy regions of this energy landscape, which you would need to do to converge to the correct distribution. Now, um, Again, the, um, the problem here is not one of optimization, right? So we're not content with simply finding some low energy state, even if it was in fact the global minimum. Uh, and so that means that when we get stuck in a local minimum, the picture is not so much one of gradient descent where you just go down until you, you reach the bottom and then you stop, but rather you should picture something more like a golf ball stuck in a sand trap. So if you keep hitting at it, it'll eventually find its way out. It can just take a large number of iterations. So uh, this finish, This concludes the first section. Um, I don't know if there's any questions now or if I should just move on to the next. So there are a few questions here. So one of our students, he, he asks, how do you verify that you get indeed the right answer from, from this approach? Uh, so it's something that is, um, it's an interesting question. So on the one hand, uh, it's quite easy to prove formally that this does converge. On the other hand, you don't necessarily know how fast it converges. So these algorithms are widely used in practice. They have uh, firm underpinnings in the sense that we can prove correctness, but in a sense, they're sometimes used or often used in a rather heuristic way. So you just run them until they seem like they've converged and then you, you hope that, uh, that you've made the judgment call correctly. And there are a number of techniques for gauging this. And, and then at, at your just previous slice, the slide was one of our students who asked, is this simulated annealing? Uh, no, this is um, simulated annealing is, was a generaliz generalization of this that came a few decades later. 
So the idea of so this the idea is to simply draw samples from this fixed random dis, this fixed uh, probability distribution for a fixed temperature, and uh, it was in the early 50s that this was proposed. And then yeah, uh, sometime later, the idea of simulated annealing came about, where you do something like this in a number of iterate or uh, in a number of stages, where in each stage you then gradually lower the temperature. That's kind of an extra piece that's on top of this framework that we're not quite dealing with here. Okay, thanks. I think that clears the questions from this this section. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Uh, so moving on to the next part then, with the intention of speeding up convergence, we then develop the quantum uh, to do this sampling. And in order to build up to it, I'd like to spend just a little bit longer on the classical side and talk about uh, how do people actually propose these moves. I never really specified that. How does step one work? So the most common approach is uh, what's called the local approach. So you take your current bit string, you pick one of the spins or one of the bits at random, and you flip it. And so um, this is called local because you always have a coming distance of one, so to one of the neighboring states. And it means that on this picture here, you could you could imagine this as taking either a small step to the left or to the right in this case. So why is this a reasonable approach? Well. If the step had been to the left here, it would have been downhill, so it would always be accepted. Uh, here instead, the step turned out to be to the right, so it's a little bit uphill, but only a little bit. So because it's only a small increase in energy, because there's only so, so much altitude you can cover in a single small step like this, um, mo moves from this proposal are reasonably likely to be accepted. On the other hand, you can ask yourself, does this mean that if you are starting from the local minimum I've shown here, that it would be easy to escape? And the answer is no, because these are small steps, not just in the y direction, <clears throat> excuse me, in energy, but also along the x direction in Hamming distance. And so it means that you would need several such steps to be accepted uh, in a sequence in order to actually escape from the steep local minimum. And that's unlikely to happen. And so it means that you typically have to wait for long stretches in order to actually successfully escape, which makes the whole convergence slow. Now, you could imagine also using a non-local scheme instead to propose uh, moves in step one. There are several such schemes uh, of which there are no silver bullets. And so to illustrate the difficulty that they generally face, I will just uh, talk about an extreme approach here, uh, which is maximally non-local. In fact, one in which you just pick your next, uh, your next state uh, uniformly at random. So um, this has the nice advantage that it jumps far. So if a move like this were accepted, you cover a large hamming distance, and so it would bring you right out of your current local minimum and to somewhere totally different in the landscape. The downside, though, is that starting from some local minimum, some low energy state, these moves tend to be sharply uphill, which means that they're overwhelmingly likely to be rejected. And so it means that you still end up stuck for long stretches in these local minima, just for a different reason. Now, ideally, what you would want is something that's kind of the best of both worlds, which is what we aim to do with our quantum algorithm. What you would want is some strategy to propose moves that are more like this one here that are far in Hamming distance typically, but only uh, bring a small change in energy along the y-axis. And of course, the goal here is not just to find the ground state, but rather to move quickly between different low energy regions in order to speed up the convergence of, uh, of this MCMC -MC sampling algorithm. And so we do this quantum mechanically by uh, proposing a new state using our quantum processor and then accepting or rejecting the proposal using our classical computer. So specifically in step one, we go to our quantum device. And if your current state is some bit string S, you prepare the computational state S. You then time evolve it or simulate time evolution by the transverse field Ising or quantum Ising Hamiltonian corresponding to the classical uh, problem instance that you're given. So if you're a condensed matter physicist, you could call this uh, a quench experiment. If you're a computer scientist, you can instead think of this as querying the classical energy landscape, which is fully contained along the diagonal of this Hamiltonian in quantum superposition due to the off-diagonal terms that generate transitions and in general drive you away from your initial computational state. Finally, you measure in the computational basis, and whatever bit string you get out, you call that S prime, and you take that as your, your candidate state. 
you then return to your classical computer and you compute the acceptance probability, which I've now written out in uh, quantum mechanical notation. Now, you have every reason to be worried about this fraction in blue because it's the ratio of two different quantum transition probabilities from S to S prime and from S prime to S, where I'll remind you, these are both just bit strings. These are just computational states. Now, um, in general, we don't expect to be able to evaluate either of these probabilities efficiently, um, but it turns out we don't have to because whatever their values are, we can prove for this particular Hamiltonian that they must be equal to each other. And so the whole fraction has to be equal to one, and we get a similar cancellation as we saw earlier with the normalizing constant, the partition function. And so what we're left with is an expression that we have to evaluate on our classical computer that is very simple. It can, in fact, be evaluated in quadratic time. So this gives us our acceptance probability. And then, just like in the fully classical case, we actually make the jump with probability A. Otherwise, we stay put and try again. And in any case, we pass the resulting bit string back to our quantum processor. Now, this is an algorithm that's a little unusual and it has some interesting features. So for one, assuming it's hard to sample from the measurement distribution of the time evolved state, it means that this is an algorithm that's hard to mimic classically. And yet it inherits the convergence guarantees from classical MCMC, meaning that it's what you might call semi-heuristic in that the convergence is guaranteed. So the fact that it produces the right answer is guaranteed, but the speed at which it gets there must be established empirically, much like uh, is, is typically done in classical CMC, like we just talked about a minute ago in the questions. Uh, now, more broadly, this is um, a rather different computational paradigm than most near-term quantum algorithms. For one, it's not variational, it's not adiabatic, and in fact, uh, what's quite unusual about it is that it uses single shots, so it passes bit strings back and forth between the classical and quantum processors, not just empirical averages. So we often think of quantum computers as machines that give us expectation values or you know, some number that's the answer to a problem. But more fundamentally, of course, uh, they're random number generators uh, in which we put in an initial state and then we sample from the resulting output distribution. And so this algorithm uses them fundamentally in this way. Moreover, because it's uh, stochastic, uh, we find in our experiments that it's quite robust to noise. And in fact, you might say that it fails gracefully with increasing noise, by which I mean that noise doesn't cause it to completely fall apart and produce the wrong answer, but rather to gradually become more classical and in turn converge more slowly. So uh, this uh, concludes the second part before getting into the third. Do we have any questions? So here we had a question on slide 10. Sure. Um, and I think the question was just regarding how this is, how the A is computed. So they, they were asking like, isn't, the the the, nom the numerator and the denominator just the same thing irrespectively of what the Hamiltonian is in this expression. Uh, <clears throat> generally, no, right? If I, um, um, yeah, uh, so imagine for a, for a generic Hamiltonian, if I prepare some computational state, say all zeros, and I measure in the computational basis, and the I get some some other strings, say all ones. The probability of that transition occurring is, in general, not the probability of the reverse occurring. It's a, a special symmetry that, uh, uh, for this particular Hamiltonian, the fact that all that it's not only um, Hermitian but in fact um, symmetric that causes it to be uh, that uh, that causes this to drop out. So I think that's clear. Yeah, thanks. And I think that that was the only question from this section. All right, excellent. So. Um, so yeah, so we we introduced this quantum algorithm, and uh, as I said, the the eventual answer to which it converges is theoretically guaranteed. And so now what remains is to look empirically at how fast it gets there. So we do this to begin uh, in simulations in order to look at the average case behavior over a large number of uh, problem instances. <clears throat> 
And so what we did is generate uh, a large number of random instances and for each one analyze the convergence rate that we get both for our quantum algorithm and for a number of classical alternatives. And then we, uh, we looked at the average uh, convergence rate, the average performance, uh, as a function of the two knobs that we have that control the problem difficulty. So the two things we can adjust at this stage are the temperature and the problem size n, so the number of spins. And the, the natural way or one natural way to visualize the results is to start by taking a vertical slice through this parameter space. So in other words, to hold the number of spins fixed, the problem size, but to vary the temperature. And the resulting plots look like this, where here I'm showing convergence rate on the y-axis, so higher is good, it means fast, versus the temperature on the x-axis. And I'm showing this for uh, classical MCMC using a local proposal. And so what this curve means is that at intermediate temperatures, the convergence is quite fast, but the, the rate drops off sharply at both extremely high and extremely low temperatures. The other natural way we could think of visualizing the results is by instead taking a horizontal slice through our parameter space. So to hold the temperature fixed, but instead to vary the problem size. And if we do that for, again, this classical MCMC, we get something like this, where we see that the uh, convergence rate is exponentially slow in the number of spins in the average case. Now, we can add to this uh, results from an, a different uh, classical approach, the opposite extreme I mentioned earlier, that's completely non-local, where we pick our moves uniformly at random. And so in the left panel, we see that uh, at intermediate temperatures, the convergence rate is about the same, but it's faster than the local approach at, uh, at the extremes of high and low temperature. On the other hand, when we look on the right panel at the scaling with problem size, we see that it's also exponentially slow. So it's it's comparable with our, our uh, the first classical approach. And in fact, if you do the fifth, you find that it's a little bit slower even or a little bit worse scaling. Now, in contrast, uh, our quantum algorithm uh, in, in noiseless simulations is shown in red here, where in the left panel, we see um, still a slowdown as we enter, uh, as the temperature decreases and we enter this, this harder regime, this kind of glassy regime. Um, and yet uh, the decrease is much less pronounced than it is for these classical alternatives. And in fact, a number of others that I haven't shown here for simplicity. Uh, and the result is that at low temperatures, you end up with substantially faster convergence here on average than you do with, the, with many classical alternatives. On the right panel, we see that uh, the convergence rate is still exponentially slow. So we're getting still a straight line on this semi-log plot, uh, which means that we're not getting uh, you know, an exponential speed up like the Shores algorithm, for instance, nor would we even expect that. Uh, but rather, uh, because the slope is quite a bit shallower than those for these classical alternatives and, and of course, some, uh, some other ones not shown, uh, we, we find from numerical fits that on the average case, we seem uh, to have a polynomial speed up more akin to Grover's algorithm. Of course, Grover's algorithm gives a quadratic speed up, whereas when we fit our data, we observe a speed up that is instead somewhere between cubic and quartic. And in, find, in fact, we find that this persists across a wide range of temperatures and uh, a number of, uh, of families of problem instances. So uh, these noiseless simulations let us analyze the, the, uh, the, uh, the behavior over a number of, uh, of different problems. Uh, so we can kind of do these in batches. And uh, in order to, uh, to zoom in more closely on illustrative ones, we now turn to experiments and uh, dig a little deeper into illustrative problem instances. Before I do that, though, are there any questions about the simulation results? Everything was crystal clear on simulations. Perfect. So now diving into the experiments a little, uh, what these ultimately teach us are about how the algorithm responds to noise in our physical devices, which can be hard to simulate precisely. Now, I won't get uh, too much into the experimental details in the interest of time, although for those of you that are interested, uh, the details are all spelled out in the paper and in the supplemental material. We did our experiments on IBM superconducting quantum processors. There are a number of, uh, of different data sets presented in the paper. The one that I'll focus on here uses 10 qubits. Um, the average error rates for these qubits for both the gates and the readout are state of the art as shown here. 
and um, they allowed us to trotterize the uh, the Hamiltonian dynamics part of the this um, the algorithm, so the the quantum step, using up to forty eight layers of parallel two qubit gates. We used extensive twirling throughout, both on the two qubit gates and on the readout. And the two qubit gate, the unitary that um, that was the the hardest one to do, that arises repeatedly due to trotterization of this model, uh, is an RZZ rotation. So it's you know an exponential of uh, z tensor z, uh, rotated by some angle that depends on the problem coefficients and the trotter time step that we pick. Now the textbook way to compile this is using a pair of C knots with a single qubit rotation in between. This is what you'll find in Nielsen and Chuang, for instance. Uh, we did not do this. Instead, what we did was uh, implemented directly using a native RZX rotation that we have on our superconducting devices. So we have this native ZX coupling that we, in fact, used to do the C-knots in the first place. And so effectively, what we did is instead of doing two C-knots, we did a fraction of one by some angle uh, that uh, that matches the, the one that, uh, that we actually want to implement for the trotterization. So this turns out to be quite uh, quite a nice approach. Uh, you end up cutting the gate time by more than half, which gives you quite a substantial increase in fidelity and uh, enabled the kind of results that we end up getting. So looking at an illustrative problem instance, here I'm showing again convergence rate versus temperature for two classical MCM3 strategies, uh, the, the local one and the opposite extreme uniform one that we looked at earlier. Now, in theory, the convergence rate that we expect from our quantum algorithm here looks like this dotted red line. And what we find experimentally is the solid red line, where the error bands denote 99% uh, confidence intervals. So you can see that uh, the noise in our devices does cause a slowdown in convergence rate here, uh, but we still end up converging faster in terms of number of iterations than either of these classical uh, alternatives, and in fact, faster than about a dozen other ones that I haven't shown here for the sake of simplicity. So to actually demonstrate uh, our algorithm a little more concretely, we used it for um, a sample problem, which is one of estimating the thermal average magnetization. So the magnetization of some state S, some n-bit string, is just the fraction of upspins, so the fraction of plus ones minus the fraction of downspins of minus ones. And uh, so this is for a single spin configuration. And what we try to estimate is instead the Boltzmann average, the thermal average in the classical model of this quantity. Now, uh, as I said earlier, this is a, a classic example of where one would use MCMC. And the way this is typically done is by uh, generating, by running the chain or the yeah, running your algorithm for a certain number of moves and using the running average estimate of magnetization to, uh, to estimate this Boltzmann average quantity. Now, we did this for a temperature of 0 0.1. I'd like to, uh, to really make the point here that this temperature is uh, an arbitrary problem parameter that we get to pick, and it's just something that, uh, that goes into the algorithm. It has nothing at all to do with the temperature of our superconducting device. Rather, we pick this temperature to be high enough that the problem is not just one of optimization, so the Boltzmann distribution is not just concentrated on the ground state, but low enough that this thermal average magnetization depends only on a small number of states, in fact, only about four of them, uh, that are the four lowest energy states, and in fact, they're all local minima. And so it means that this model instance really does kind of look like the picture I've been showing throughout here. If anything, it's maybe a little bit worse. So to get a baseline for uh, for how or for for how things perform here, uh, I'll start by showing the performance of a classical algorithm. So here, what I'm showing is the current magnetization, so the magnetization of the current bit string, as a function of how many MCMC iterations have taken place. And so here, this is for the purely local classical approach, and I've labeled the magnetizations of the ground, first, second, and third excited states. So as you can see in this figure, what happens with the, this local classical approach is that it quickly finds its way into a local minimum here, the third excited state, and then it more or less gets stuck there for long periods, only briefly jumping out. 
Now, if we actually use this to estimate the magnetization, so we compute the running average of this quantity over this chain, as well as uh, many others that are that follow the same distribution, we find that it doesn't really seem to converge to the true value shown in the dotted line here. Now, of course, theoretically, we can prove that it must converge. Uh, the issue is that it just you have to wait uh, quite a few for uh, for quite a bit longer. Uh, in fact, this particular chain takes on the order of uh, tens of millions of iterations to converge. We can also compare this with another classical approach of picking the next move uniformly or proposing the next move uniformly. And here we see similar behavior. So you quickly find your way into local minima. And uh, you maybe jump a little bit between them, but you tend to stay stuck for on the order of hundreds of moves at a time. And the result is that similarly, you converge quite slowly. Now, in sharp contrast to both of these is our class is our quantum algorithm, rather, where what I'm showing here is experimental data, where you can see in the top plot that it's able to jump between these different local minima, these different low energy states that are far from one another, uh, with significantly higher frequency than either of these classical alternatives. And as a result, uh, it converges substantially faster than them, so on the order of hundreds of iterations. So finally, this is my, my last slide with data. Uh, let's let's dig into the mechanism underlying this quantum speed up in terms of number of iterations. So I said earlier that the the classical local strategy tended to suggest jumps that look like this one at the top that were close in X, so close in Hamming distance, but also close in Y, so you only gain a little bit of energy. Uh, and so we can see this reflected in the actual distribution. Here I'm showing the cumulative distribution of uh, of Hamming jumps, or sorry, of cumulative distribution of jumps in Hamming distance. Still a little early here. I'm still a little, uh, still waking up a little. So um, we see a step rate right around uh, one, which is expected, of course, because this uh, strategy always picks a, a next state that's exactly a distance of one away from the current state. Um, we see a similar concentration when we look at the cumulative distribution of the absolute energy change. Um, so that's in the right panel here. Now I'm showing cumulative histograms or integrated histograms here just because I, I wanted to avoid having to pick some arbitrary bin size. If you prefer to think of these in terms of histograms, that's just the derivative of these curves. Now, um, on the other hand, I said that the opposite extreme classical approach tended to make big jumps that were far not only along X, but also typically far along the Y direction in energy. And we see this reflected again in these two same distributions. So we see that both in Hamming distance on the left plot and in energy on the right plot, the distributions are substantially more spread out than those for the local proposal, which is what we expect. Now, in contrast, I said earlier that our quantum proposal tended to suggest moves that were more like the one shown at the top here, that combined features of both of these classical extremes. And in fact, this is borne out in the data. So for our quantum algorithm in theory, we find that the distribution of Hamming distances tends to follow quite closely that for the uniform proposal. So you tend to jump quite large distances in X. But on the other hand, the distribution of energies follows much more closely that of the local proposal. So you tend to stay fairly localized along Y, uh, not going up or down in energy all that much. And we see these same effects in our experimental data as well, which is the solid uh, red curve. Uh, we see that the effects are attenuated a little bit because of device noise, but that uh, otherwise they're still clearly there. So to recap, we have this sampling problem that arises in applications for which MCMC is a powerful approach, often the best that we have, but it can be slow in some settings. In an effort to speed up convergence, we proposed the quantum algorithm uh, for this, which we then simulated. And in noiseless simulations, we found a speed up on average that was somewhere between cubic and quartic. And finally, we were able to implement this experimentally, and we found sufficient robustness to uh, experimental imperfections that even in experiments, we were able to observe a speed up uh, defined by number of iterations required to, uh, to converge to within some desired error tolerance. And so I'd like to conclude by returning to where I started uh, and noting that current quantum devices are good at sampling from complicated probability distributions. And so what we've effectively done is added a classical outer loop to channel this ability into something useful.
and ultimately this yet this lets you use near uh, and or uh, existing and near term quantum processors to sample from complicated distributions that actually arise in subroutines of many applications, not simply those that are meant to be pathologically hard. And so on that note, I'd like to thank you all for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, David. This was uh, extremely interesting. We've had quite a few questions and the last part of the talk. So whilst I remind anyone who's on the call um, that they can keep asking questions in the chat and under the Q&A button, I'll, I'll dive straight into the questions that, that we've had so far. So I think we've had three questions which are essentially the same. I'll try to, if we go to slide 16, I'll try to, so let's see, was this the slide I meant? Maybe we have to go back a bit more, 14 maybe. Yes, here, this 15, yeah. Um, so here, the, the, the gist of it is essentially people asking whether or not the noise of a quantum computer can help you um, in the high temperature regime, and if you could comment on why the quantum experiment is outperforming the quantum noiseless quantum theory in the high temperature regime. Yeah, that's a good question. So the the reason I didn't focus on this, or the, the reason I didn't get into this is because the high temperature regime is one that is easy classically. And so um, there's really not that much opportunity nor uh, much reason to uh, to look for a quantum speed up there. Um, and so in fact, uh, the, the distribution, or sorry, the proposal mechanism that works very well here is the uniform one. And the reason why is that at high temperatures, the Boltzmann distribution becomes very close to the uniform distribution. Um, and it doesn't mean, of course, that any method will, will work well at high temperatures. It just means that there exists a simple one that does. And so in particular, you can see that the local strategy actually does quite poorly here. And the reason why is that it becomes kind of periodic in a funny sense, which screws up the convergence. Now, our quantum algorithm uh, does a little bit better than that at high temperatures, but uh, it's still not uh, you know, completely optimized for this setting. And um, so you can see this by the dotted red line at, in the high T regime. And to the best of our knowledge, the reason why the noise actually seems to help in the experiments, uh, at high T at least, is that what the distribution that you end up seeing in experiments is kind of a mixture of the true quantum effect plus some noise that kind of resembles the, the uh, uniform proposal to begin with. And so in a sense, the, uh, the solid red line is something of a hybrid between the dotted red line and uh, the, the gray line. And so that's why it seems to increase at high temperatures. OK, thanks. Now we have two questions for from anonymous attendees. The first question is, during the simulation, does the speed up you found mean that the simulated quantum algorithm actually represents a faster classical <laughs> algorithm? Um, it depends on your definition of faster, I guess. Um, if you mean faster in terms of asymptotic scaling, uh, and you think that, uh, or actually, no, no, that uh, definitely not. I, I take that back. Uh, the the cost of of simulating the quantum algorithm on a classical computer is, of course, exponential in the size of the system. So, uh, so. Yeah, what I'm showing here is the number of iterations required, but of course, uh, the the actual wall clock uh, cost of this is is much higher when uh, when we do classical simulations of of uh, this quantum algorithm. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's see, that was the first one done, and then the second anonymous attendee asks, can the noise in experiments? Effect acceptance rule as they, the terms with the Hamiltonian evolution should be replaced by the actual evolution, or does the quantum part still simplify? Uh, yeah, so the, the quantum part still simplifies. So, um, so even if you use the very large Trotter step, even if you were quite far from the continuous evolution, you can show for this family of circuits that, in fact, um, at least in principle, that the this symmetry condition that we need for the uh, the acceptance probability to simplify that still holds. Um, the thing that can potentially cause issues is if you had noise that that brought you away from this, but we were able to uh, to mitigate that noise and 
Um, while we certainly still had noise in our experiments, it didn't seem to bias us one way or another. Okay, thanks. And then we have a question from Christopher Long, a PhD student in our group. He says, how do you choose the transition and transition strength gamma? Yeah, Christopher, that's a great question, uh, to which I unfortunately don't have a great answer. <laughs> um, we, we don't really have a, a well-informed way of doing this. Uh, and so we, we looked at different settings. We found that the performance uh, did not vary all that much based on, uh, on how we did it. It seemed quite robust. And so when we ended up doing both in the numerics and the experiments, it was actually just picking them at random. Um, so we just kind of picked a, a broad interval. We sampled the settings uniformly from there, and uh, that was enough to get quite good performance. But uh, if you have any ideas on how to optimize this, this is something uh, we, we'd love to know about because it seems like an obvious way to, uh, to get extra performance out of this. I think Christopher is somewhat of a group expert in optimizing all kind of stuff. So maybe this is a good thing for Christopher to add to your long, long list of things that you're thinking about. Um, do we have more questions? Um, so I had a, a, a so we have a question for Haoma from Haoma Yuan, another PhD student. Uh, can you choose to transition from the MCMC process? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, me neither, actually. So maybe if Homo clarifies this. So I think, yeah. Still not sure what it means. I think maybe why it's Homo thinks of a way to rephrasing the question. David, so you've looked at, at the Boltzmann distribution. How about looking at other, other distributions? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, so the, the Boltzmann distribution, even just on the classical side, is a very nice candidate for these algorithms because um, uh, it's one where you, you can't generally compute uh, the, the probabilities in question, you just have this, this more symbolic equation for them, um, but you can compute them up to some unknown normalizing factor. So it's the normalizing factor that causes the issue. And so this is, uh, and it, it drops out in MCMC. And so that's why it's, it's a very nice fit for this. Um, it's possible that the same approach or the same family of approaches could be interesting for other distributions as well. Uh, but, um, I, I'm not sure the fit is quite as natural as it is for the Boltzmann distribution. Right. Um, and I think we now have Christopher and potentially Haum as well. Yeah. Hi. Call to clarify the question. Yeah. I wonder, like, you have a gamma, but the gamma could, uh, like, the transition probability could also come from the MCMC because you get a, like, basically a number to go jump from another place to another place. I wonder if it is possible to add some like uh, previous decisions information to the last decision to have a trans transition. Would this be good like MCMC process? And... Mm -hmm. That's an interesting idea. I know there are, uh, there are classical algorithms of this type that yes. are kind of yes. self-adjusting in the sense, in a sense as you go. Um, I think one of the difficulties is that it it can be tricky for them to still be Markovian, um, and so I think the issues of convergence become a little bit trickier there. But uh, assuming that that there is some way to handle that, then then yeah, that's an interesting idea. Although I I can't comment much on it. I haven't really thought of that. Okay, interesting. Yes, thanks. I mean, could it be interesting? Yes. Just... Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That is a, an interesting idea. Yes. Okay, so I think well, there's one more question from an anonymous attendee who asks, how did you come up with this? <laughs> I don't know, the usual way, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I don't really have a, a good story for it. It was just, uh, you know, we were we were exploring and uh, this, this seemed like a, a natural thing to do and turned out to work quite well. Were you motivated by these sampling experiments or 
Yeah, well, I mean, the motivation was to to try and bridge this gap between sampling and actually doing something useful. So to to look for a problem um, that somehow is naturally close to what your quantum device actually just wants to do in the first place. Uh, and so this somehow seemed like low hanging fruit, or it seemed like an interesting space that uh, that was not that was, you know, uh, just a small step away from what we're doing already. Right. I think we've cleared all the questions We're we're well on time. And, and it's just left for us to thank you once more, David, for for a phenomenal seminar. Please. Yeah. Do let us know if you're in the UK. It would be a pleasure to to take you for for dinner and the lab tour. And um, yeah, I'll do that. I would like that very much. And uh, yeah, thank you for organizing, and I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah, thanks so much. And for for everyone on the on the call, thanks thanks for tuning in. Um, next week it's at three p.m. as well when when we will hear by from Christoph Fuchs about his take on foundational quantum mechanics so, so very different from from today's talk um, but thanks to everyone for for tuning in and, and see you next week